Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I believe some of you may have already been in uh, our little chat before we got started, but to the rest of you, thank you for being here. Uh, this is the first of a two-part webinar series on CAR-T. My name is Sabrina Hanna, and I am the Managing Director of the Cancer Collaborative, and I have the privilege of moderating today's discussion on the evolution of CAR-T cell therapies and future directions. Over the past few years, uh, chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR-T as we call it, uh, have revolutionized the landscape of cancer treatment. And today we will explore that evolving landscape and the exciting prospects that lie, that lie ahead. I'm honored to have with me to discuss this. Uh, Levin Billen, who is the Director of Medical Affairs for Cellular Therapy at Kite, uh, a Gilead company. Um, sorry, I'm just letting everybody in as I'm talking at the same time. Um, so, uh, Levin Billin, who's the medical director of medical affairs for cellular therapy at Kite, a Gilead company in Canada. He has a PhD in biochemistry from McMaster and was a fellow at the program in gene function and expression at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, medical, medical school prior to joining the industry in 2015. We also uh, have Stephanie Michaud, who actually did make it onto the call, who's the president and CEO of BioCanRx, a not-for-profit that seeks to accelerate the delivery of innovative immunotherapies from the bench to the bedside. In this position, Stephanie brings more than 20 years of public government and private sector experience in research and science and technology innovation policy. She strives to create partnerships between government, not-for-profits, academia, and industry to maximize the impact of research funded by the BioCanRx network on the lives of those affected by cancer. This includes the creation of new opportunities to include the patient voice as equal partner in the BioCanRx research program. Dr. Michaud uh, earned a PhD in organic chemistry from McGill University. She is involved with a number of not-for-profit organizations and currently serves on the Board of Research Canada. And also Dr. Isabel Fleury is a hematologist and a medical oncologist working at Maisonneuve Rosemont Hospital in Montreal. She's a clinical associate professor at the University of Montreal and is the program director of the Fellowship in Lymphoma and Immune Effector Cells. Her main interest is improving the care of patients with lymphoma. She is the medical lead of the Lymphoma Clinic at Maisonneuve Rosemont Hospital. She contributes to clinical research in lymphoma through participating in phase one to three trials. She is the instigator of the C3I Lymphoma Registry, collecting clinical and bioclinical data to better understand lymphoma in the real world setting. She participates in clinical trials of immune effector cells, is actively involved in the implementation of CAR-T in clinical, clinical practice in Quebec, and is the medical lead of the Quebec Immunocellular Therapy Network. So we'll begin this uh, webinar by exploring current pipelines, followed by discussion on emerging and potential applications and the impact on patients. And as we move through the presentations and discussions, please don't hesitate to actively participate in the chat and the upcoming Q&A session. Your input, of course, will enrich our dialogue and make this webinar even more informative. So with that, I will uh, turn over to Levin Billen from Gilead to kick us off. OK, thank you, Sabrina, for the opportunity to be involved in this webinar with this uh, great panel. Um, so currently, Kite, which is a CAR-T company that's owned by Gilead Sciences. Um, so right now we have two CAR-T products that are that are aided and reimbursed in Canada to treat two different types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So we have uh, Yaskarda for patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma in a third line or later setting. So that is to say after at least two prior therapies. And we also have a product called Tocardis, uh, which is for uh, currently indicated and reimbursed for mantle cell lymphoma, MCL, also in a third line or later setting for patients who have already been treated with a Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So if we look out uh, five or seven years into the future uh, and look at the pipeline from a Kite Gilead perspective, um, we do have a strong pipeline that we feel will continue to bring benefits to patients with blood cancer. Um, this includes new indications for Yaskarda and Tocardis, 
uh, new products that may further improve upon the outcomes we're currently seeing, and also new products to treat uh, uh, other types of blood cancer. So as I mentioned before, Yescarta and Tocardis are currently reimbursed uh, for third line DLPCL and third line MCL respectively. However, between these two products, we have three new indications that have uh, that have already been approved by Health Canada and are currently navigating their way through Canada's reimbursement pathway. Um, so the first of these three new indications that I want to discuss is moving Yescarta earlier into the treatment pathway in DLBCL, namely into second line. Um, while many patients have benefited from Yescarta in a third line or later setting, unfortunately, some patients don't get that opportunity due to rapidly progressing disease. Uh, and in particular, there's a group of patients in second line for whom the current standard of care, um, which is the autologous stem cell transplant pathway, has poor outcomes. So if we think of patients who are either refractory to their frontline therapy or relapse within a year, we know that the, the, the standard of care in second line does not serve these patients well. So we're hoping that by moving Yescarta into second line, we'll have more patients that are able to, to um, get the benefits of CAR-T. So staying with Yescarta, we're also indicated um, in third line or later follicular lymphoma or FL. So while FL is generally considered an indolent disease, um, for many patients, by the time they get to that third line setting, um, their remissions have become quite short and these patients often don't have any novel um, treatment options to them. They often have to recycle uh, uh, prior used or, or older chemotherapy regimens. Um, moving on to Tocardis, uh, last year we received an indication from Health Canada for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, in a second line or later setting. So ALL is an, in, uh, an incredibly fast moving disease with very poor outcomes after frontline therapy. And having Tocardis as a treatment option for these patients uh, could bring them a lot of benefit. So if we look a little bit further out into the horizon, um, we do have a, a variety of clinical trials that, that we're currently conducting. Uh, two that I want to bring attention to will bring Yescarta even sooner into the treatment pathway for patients in both follicular lymphoma and in DLBCL. So we have a trial called Zuma 22, um, which is a confirmatory phase three trial that supports the um, third line FL indication. However, within the Zuma 22 trial, there is the potential to use Yescarta even earlier in second line follicular lymphoma for patients who progress within 24 months uh, from the start of frontline therapy. And this is a group that, that's been well documented to have um, uh, inferior outcomes. Um, shifting back into DLBCL, we have a, a phase three trial called Zuma 23, which looks at bringing Yescarta all the way into frontline DLBCL uh, treatment for patients with high risk disease. Now we know that RCHOP has been the, a phenomenal standard of care for patients for, for about 30 years, but we know that patients with low risk features tend to do incredibly well with RCHOP and patients with high risk disease slightly less so. So the Zuma 23 trial will look at comparing Yescarta to RCHOP in high risk frontline DLBCL. So on top of, of, of uh, bringing Yescarta earlier into the treatment pathway, Kite Gilead is also looking to further improve on, on the already great outcomes by bringing newer CAR-T products. So Yescarta targets the CD19 antigen on lymphoma cells, but we know that in, in some cases relapses are driven by a loss of expression of CD19. Um, so we have a product called Kite 363, which is currently in phase one, um, which is a bisystronic CAR-T product that targets both the CD19 and CD20 antigens. And the hope there is that by targeting multiple antigens at the same time, we can further improve, improve upon outcomes. Um, so I'd like to wrap up by saying so far what I've talked about has mostly pertains to a group of, of uh, blood cancers um, called B-cell malignancies, but Kite Gilead is also committed to investigating CAR-T therapies in other forms of blood cancer. Um, through a collaboration with a company called Arcelix, Kite Gilead is currently working on a phase two clinical trial for a product called Kite 772, which is a CAR-T product for relapse refractory multiple myeloma. 
And we also have uh, a, another product called Kite 222, uh, which is currently in phase one for relapse refractory uh, acute myelogenous leukemia, which is a devastating disease. And, and our CAR-T product, Kite 222, targets an antigen called CLL1, which is heavily uh, expressed on AML cells. So overall, you know, from the company's perspective, we're focused on bringing CAR-T therapies to patients who need them, whether that be, um, you know, bringing it earlier for our, our current products, developing new products to further improve um, the outcomes we are already seeing, as well as developing new products for other types of uh, blood cancers. Thank you. Oh, you're on mute, Sabrina. I'm muted. Uh, Stephanie, if you're ready, the floor is yours. All right, folks. Um, I have been experiencing some very significant IT issues. Um, so my apologies for this. We've, um, of course, I chose today to work um, uh, from the hospital and there has been a very significant IT update and I don't know that it's going to let me even share my screen at this point. Uh, it's a miracle that I'm even here because I was unable to launch uh, to launch Teams. So, um, so I'll move forward. I don't believe that I'll be able to, um, no, 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 nope. Sorry, folks. Um, I'm very limited in what I can do today. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, who I am, um, but really I'll tell you a lot about BioCanRx. Uh, the presentation that I prepared for you today was to provide you with a little bit of information about BioCanRx, how we came to exist, and the role that we're playing in the academic landscape when it comes to the production of CAR-Ts for what is commonly being referred to as a Made in Canada CAR-T program. Uh, so I'm really excited to hear about all of the developments from Kite and uh, the development of all of these new um, CAR-T cells that are able to, can folks see that right now? My screen has suddenly appeared on, on my screen. I don't think that you can, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, so, BioCanRx was created in 2015, and the mission of the organization is to accelerate the development of immunotherapies for the clinic. BioCanRx is seeking to address um, a gap that really exists in the Canadian landscape when it comes to developing uh, drugs. Uh, and our area of focus as, as a network is to focus on the development of immunotherapies, and we're agnostic uh, as to what those immunotherapies are and have worked on development projects and have invested in clinical trials that include oncolytic uh, viruses, for example, in combination uh, with, with uh, PD-1 inhibitors, so materials like PEMBRO, um, different types of adoptive cell therapies, such as TILs, in addition to CAR-Ts. And by we by design, we have very much gone forward with with ensuring that we have all of the necessary ingredients uh, to advance a technology to the clinic. So if any of you are keeping up with the science policy literature, you'll hear very frequently that Canada really hits above its weight when it comes to um, new findings and the great research that we do. And we're very strong, in particular, in the medical and the health sciences. Where there's a little bit of a gap is in the development of those technologies so that we can take them from the lab or what is commonly referred to as the bench all the way uh, to the clinic, so getting them into a clinical trial. And so because this is a huge gap in Canada, this is where we have chosen to focus our efforts. And our efforts are centered on ensuring that we have biomanufacturing in place, that we are able to provide a certain level of expertise when it comes to the how to develop these different types of technologies. And then additionally, the biggest one is being able to provide funding uh, to support those efforts because in the grant landscape, which is what academics know, this is what academics apply for, are for grants, there's typically very, very little support for those very expensive developmental activities uh, that are going to tap into and require um, expensive activities, for example, like GMP biomanufacturing. 
So the story of CAR T and and BioCanRx is is really one was is really one born of frustration. In 2016, we had invited a number uh, of fantastic speakers at our annual conference, and um, our our scientists were invigorated by the by the lectures. And it was a researcher in particular from Vanderbilt that have given this wonderful talk about all of the different CAR Ts that they were able to make. And uh, they came out of that a little bit deflated because they could not, right? We could not. We didn't have that ability in Canada to be able to make these products. And so after uh, after a beer at a conference, as uh, as frequently happens, this group of scientists of our network got together and said, you are able to make this part of our CAR T and you are able to make that part of our CAR T. Canada is a big country and these groups that were speaking to each other, one of them was in the eastern part of Canada, the other one on the west coast. And so we decided that we needed to stitch up all of those different pieces together in order to be able to produce our own car -tees and really support uh, Canadian research so that Canadian researchers can design their own car -tees. And so this is what we did. And it took us two two years uh, to be able to bring on board this biomanufacturing capacity and then launch uh, a clinical trial that is still ongoing today, which is called the CLICK-01, and CLICK stands for Canadian-led immunotherapies uh, in cancer. That's run out of the Ottawa hospital, but also has a site in Vancouver um, and is a CD19 CAR-T. Uh, so that launched after two years and uh, is still ongoing, having uh, successfully received funding from uh, the CIHR uh, for a phase two. Now we've established this wonderful platform, and I really regret I had all these great slides to show you, uh, but it has attracted uh, a lot of partners who, uh, of course, saw that we had done the work of putting in place this biomanufacturing capacity, lots on, of knocks on our door to say, well, we'd like to be able to make this and can we collaborate with you and work with you? And of course, you know, the answer BioCanRx when it comes to those types of questions about collaborating and being able to make new products uh, for Canadian patients is, is invariably yes. Uh, and so we have partnerships with the NRC to develop new car -Ts. Uh, One is targeting a CD22 and the other is a multiplex car. And the very last one that I'll tell you about before turning it on over to Dr. Fleury, is uh, another CAR T that has uh, is being developed by a researcher, Doug, Dr. Doug Mahoney, out of the University of Calgary, uh, for a rare cancer, and it's for a solid cancer, uh, for the uh, treatment of alveolar alveolar soft parts sarcoma, uh, and um, that clinical trial we expect is going to be. Uh, launching in uh, some somewhat later this year, and BioCanRx supported the development of that. It's a very unique trial at this time. Uh, was um, an N of one trial, so slightly different to what's to what we've been doing in Click. But the team that has been involved in Click has been involved in this. So um, I'll end it with: If you build it, they will come, uh, and it's. Um, uh, it's been wonderful to be able to put in place this kind of capacity and uh, bring on board new technologies so that we can increase the, the number of clinical trials using these very innovative, very powerful new therapies right here in Canada. Thank you. Thank you. You want me to, can I share my, my slides, Sabrina? Is that good? Okay. Go ahead, yes. Thank you. Um, can you all see my slides? And so thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm really grateful to share with you our story uh, with CAR-T at HMR. I'm a clinician. I'm doing lots of uh, patients' visits uh, and involved in clinical trials. So I'm very glad to share with you that the story of CAR-T at HMR started with a clinical trial. Um, I was just back from my following lymphoma, and we've um, uh, were in trust with a clinical trial in large B cell lymphoma refractory, um, and so we did had the opportunity to do the first Canadian CAR T infusion in an adult. Uh, it occurred on April 26th of 2016, 
I will say that I'm always moved because I still see the patient. Uh, he and Jay is a sustained remission, allowing to do a normal life, seeing his current children living. So for us, physician, it is really game changing in the field. You know, there is lots of pivotal trials that have been published ever since. Uh, namely, uh, first uh, with uh, the Julia trial, uh, first the Zuma, uh, seven, Zuma one trial was the first one, then the Julia trial. And so we were able to start our CAR-T program at Maison of Rosemont and start with the first Canadian commercial CAR-T infusion with Camaria in August of 2019. And we did the first CAR-T commercial, Yes Carta, in December of 19. And we've added a third CAR-T with the Castus in June to, to, of uh, 2021. Um, Levin alluded to it, so there's actually uh, three uh, main indications for CAR-T. They're all in the third line, uh, third space setting. So it's for BLL in the children and young adults. It's for large B-cell and mental cell lymphoma. So ever since we've been very active in clinical research at Maison of Rosemont, because we see the potential of that therapy. So we've been involved in uh, using CAR-T in endolent lymphoma, in myeloma, in solid tumors. Obviously, earlier line in therapy in oncology when it works in third line, you move it upstream, combination trial, outpatient. And I'm very proud to say that today we have infused more than 140 patients at Maison of Rosemont with CAR-T, either through clinical trial or standard of care. Um, I'm very interested in, in doing real world analysis. So we're actually looking at what, what happened to patients who received CAR-T outside of clinical trial. And, and lots of them have comorbidities that would have made them ineligible to the pivotal trial. And it's very reassuring that we're receiving publication worldwide that say that CAR-T are delivered just the same in those patients with similar efficacy and no increased toxicity. So it really allows us to be more permissive in the eligibility and give access to that therapy to a growing number of patients. I mean, CAR-T is a revolution. Uh, I mean, just think about when we didn't have CAR-T in the third line space for large B cell lymphoma, refractory to two lines, overall median overall survival was six months. With CAR-T, with AxiCell, uh, we have long-term results, five years out, overall survival of 53%. So it's really a new landscape. And, and as we said, it works in the third line, you bring it upward in second line. We recently had the publication of the SUMA 7, the phase two trial that compare our standard of care, which is standard uh, autologous stem cell transplant compared to access cell even alluded to it. This is what we see from clinician perspective, more like close to half of the reduction in the progression rate for patient receiving CAR-T versus the legal stem cell transplant. And what's even more interesting is that we see that there's a survival benefit. So really the landscape is changing. Uh, we have preliminary data in first line, phase three is ongoing. So like high risk patients have benefit from those therapy despite no increased toxicity. So I mean, the landscape is changing, CAR-T indication are expanding. Um, INICE has recently positioned favorably for XSL in second line, access is pending, there's a third line, um, third CAR-T coming as well. But if we look at the FDA approved CAR-T, there's lots of new indication and hopefully uh, it's gonna merge up here and we're gonna be able to provide improved outcome to our patient here as well. But CAR-T comes with challenges, uh, and who say challenges is opportunity for research. Um, from a patient perspective, you have to keep in mind that there's like two major trips. There's few CAR-T centers throughout Canada, so patients have to travel. There's one trip for the eligibility process and leukapheresis, and there's one for the infusion. For, so from the patient perspective, you have to keep in mind all those different considerations that they might have. One of them is the financial support. Uh, actually, uh, the pharmaceutical company who uh, provide those CAR-T do actually support those trips. So this is something to keep in one mind Sorry, when implementing those therapy and doing research for that as well. Um, CAR-T center, uh, to be qualified, certified, needs lots of love, uh, lots of uh, regulation aspect to be addressed. Keep in mind that CAR-T are really made from the patient lymphocyte and all the procedure related to the handling of those cells until the infusion are under tight regulation, like they're similar to applicable um, laws product for other pharmaceutical companies. So again, there may be some interest in making it more simpler, so more CAR-T center could be uh, open uh, throughout Canada. CAR-T is a time-sensitive therapy, 
And just some uh, numbers, so enlarged B-cell lymphoma in Canada Center have published that up to 25% of the patient with a leukapheres product cannot proceed to the infusion. And this is mainly due to progressive disease. As of now, the turnaround time is approximately three weeks. Yes, you can, go, you can give bridging therapy to ease that waiting time, but there's lots of limitation with this bridging therapy. First, it may be ineffective. It may induce critical organ failure. It may improve or even reduce cardiac activity, and there's lots of bridging modality, and yet we're not sure which one's the best. There is lots of ongoing studies. Uh, some of them are very promising. I would highlight the one uh, with the radiotherapy with the synergic uh, effect being explored, master manufacturing project process, and also allogenic source of immune effect cells. So there is new CAR, CAR and K, CAR T, that are made from allogenic source of immune effect cells. So there's kind of of the shelf ready CAR T that could be more readily and more easily available for patients with progressive disease. The toxicity of the CAR T are also significant challenges. They need to be timely managed. The management relies on the clinical evaluation. It does impact the CAR T activity and it differs, unfortunately for us, for with each CAR T. So toxicity really needs to be improved. Although safe and, and, and well tolerated for most of the patient, it is still a limit to access uh, for some patient and it is a burden on our healthcare research. So there's lots of promising studies. Um, there's improvement of the actual management plan. Lots of prophylaxis studies have a very interesting result where you were we're seeing um, new studies with different immune effector cells and there are different safety belts that are being built. Uh, I've put here one example of different car construct where you can have a switch on off to actually um, modulate the intensity of the CAR T. CAR T failure, unfortunately, is uh, still significant. Uh, we're getting to understand better the mechanism. Antigen escape that Levan alluded to is a significant one. Uh, there's also a um, mechanism related to the T cells and also to the immune dysregulation within the patient and his tumor. And the microbiota is really um, a field uh, that we're getting to know and, and better understand of the reaction. There's lots of study, again, to improve the efficacy. We know that different T cells sub a subset do make different car with different efficacy. Again, NK uh, are used, allogenic source of immune infect cells, and there's new CAR-T constructs. So multiple antigen targeting are very promising, travel companion, microenvironment modulation and combination. So I just want to end by saying that it's really CAR-T is a new clinical landmark. It's really changing the way we, we practice. It does improve the quantity, the quality of life. We have longer term data with reassuring efficacy and safety, but again, full, step, full speed ahead for the research. Um, lots of promising for the future. Thank you so much, Isabel, Levin, and Stephanie. Um, I think uh, Isabel, your presentation really did a great job of wrapping up all the things that I wanted for us to discuss in this part. So I, I'll I'll just ask this question, and uh, each of you can can respond to that. Um, you talked about the efficacy, you talked about um, the toxicity, and you talked about also the earlier lines of treatment. So when we think about future directions of CAR T, how how are is what is in development, uh, or what we're like researching now going to respond to those needs for patients down the line? And any of you to, to go ahead, go ahead, Isabella, you look like you're about to speak. Well, yeah, so, I mean, it, it's a very interesting question. The thing is that uh, for us clinicians, although, you know, we have some prognosis factor, it's always hard upfront before starting any therapy to know who's going to need the CAR-T down the line, who's going to need ARCHA, who's going to need what. So, I mean, there's less of, and I didn't like alluded to it, but we're very active and in, in doing kind of correlative studies, we're actually in the process of getting the initial biopsy doing analysis there and to understand better what in there makes them to have a very more aggressive disease. So I think this is very promising era, yet we don't have much information on that side, but I think it's going to be something that's going to be um, determinant for the future. And also, I mean, we have such, you know, great result with CAR-T. I mean, we see, I mean, I've 
this patient from 2016, I can name you lots of them from, you know, ever since who back to a normal life. They don't remember like what happened and that's it. And they go back to their normal lives. So, I mean, we, we need those better therapy. I mean, chemotherapy is something to go through for the patient, their relative. It has significant impact. So although, you know, CAR T seems to be toxic on the moment, it's, you know, very short duration. And 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 we're very working hard to make it even more, you know, easier to be uh, tolerated. So I think we have a very nice future ahead. Levin, in terms of uh, what's happening on the industry side, how are, you know, how is Kite looking at it to address that efficacy, uh, bringing it into earlier lines of treatment? You talked about Yescard, of course, in in second line. Uh, and the other trials that you mentioned as well, but uh, how is how is Kite looking at that? Mm -hmm. Well, just to sort of add on to to what uh, Dr. Fleury was mentioning, <clears throat> aside from clinical trials, I mean the the company also has a lot of collaborations and is heavily focused on using real world evidence to drive further understanding of, of CAR T, and in particular you know, to, to Dr. Fleury's point, finding out who is more likely to, to have a good outcome or those that are predicted to have a, a bad outcome or toxicity really helps to, to guide uh, clinicians in the decisions they make so that they're, that they're making the, the best possible decision for that patient they have right in front of them. So we're actively engaged as well into, you know, looking at to determine not only efficacy but toxicity as well on top of all the clinical trials to bring these to new indications new and product products etc stephanie um so with respect to um you know with respect to the future with biochemrx um i've named some of the different car t's that uh, are currently under development some of which have um are um were successful in obtaining follow-on funding from the granting agencies in particular cihr uh, so that would be um there's the multiplex car there's the cd22 uh, there's Doug uh, Mahoney's uh, CAR T, very unique CAR T uh, for the treatment of solid tumors. So lots of great activity. Uh, but I'm expecting that, um, you know, as the field evolves, as Canadian researchers become more engaged with the development of, of novel CAR T's, um, and, and there's so much going on right now in the United States and, and with what colleagues here on the call have referred to, uh, I expect that we'll see, um, you know, a greater number of clinical trials here in Canada with, uh, with novel CAR-Ts uh, being offered to Canadian patients. So, and then in terms of, uh, you know, the work that BioCanRx is doing, well, how is that work going to impact the landscape let's say in five to seven years from now like what will the car t from the biocan or rx perspective look like well well i can say right now the the kind of impact that we're having right now uh is in particular in the area of all where in those provinces where um you know, Camryo, for example, uh, CD19 CAR Ts have been approved. Um, they're they're only available for a very specific age range, which is three to 25. So the impact that we're having right now in the provinces where the clinical trial is up and running and recruiting patients are for, you know, those those patients that are older than that age range. And so for them, uh, it provides access uh, to this kind of product in in Canada. Uh, the development of these uh, different uh, types of CAR T's when you, you know, answering your question with respect to uh, what can happen in five to seven years from now, um, uh, folks from Kite and Dr. Fleury will certainly note these development cycles are very long, they're very costly. Uh, and so uh, carrying this out, and um, I really wish you had seen my presentation, but I wanted to touch on the cost, right, of being able to produce these different types of products and the operational uh, costs, um, you know, that all of these different facilities have to incur. Um, in an academic setting, this is something that we're fighting and hunting for every second of every day. Uh, and so, um, um, you know, 
it will depend the evolution of the the click platform will very much depend on being able to secure those funds to be able to continue that program and expand it so that we can get into more provinces as well and you you talked about all so i just want to touch now on you know we're seeing it in cml uh, or we're, we will see it in cml in myeloma lymphoma are there other indications in blood cancer and maybe even in solid tumors where we're going to start seeing CAR T come and, and play an important role? Levin, go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll let you start with that one. Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen so much promise with CAR T in, in lymphomas and now they're sort of bridging out into to other blood cancers, to hematological malignancies. Um, but, you know, I think solid tumors are still presenting somewhat of a challenge. Um, you know, I, th I think the pipelines from a lot of companies are, are interested in moving this into solid tumors, but there are certainly challenges and, uh, you know, Right now from Kite, I think we are focused predominantly on blood cancers, but certainly, you know, there is that ambition to move out in, into the solid tumor space so that those patients um, can derive, you know, the same benefit that we've seen uh, in lymphomas and in ALL. Um, but certainly there are, you know, some novel challenges uh, that present themselves in the solid tumor space. So is, is it possible to see CAR-T expanded into more blood cancers? Um, definitely. I, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, we, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of interest in the multiple myeloma space, lots of companies there, including Kite Gilead, um, AML, so acute myelogenous leukemia is, is, is a, a you know, uh, an attempt by the, the company, right, to bring this to another type of blood cancer um, with a different antigen. So, you know, we continue to explore uh, different blood cancers and different antigens to see, you know, where where can CAR T bring value to patients. If I may, I mean, there's a significant unmet need in the T cell lymphoma, right? Remember the T, like the criteria are made from T cells, so there's actually challenge in in you know from practice kind of perspective. So I mean, there's there's still I mean Hodgkin, I mean there's some development, very promising again, but it, I mean yet in hematological cancer there's still you know, unmet need uh, to fulfill with CAR-T. And, and CAR-T are CAR-T, but right, they're immune effector cells. So, I mean, maybe we're going to rely on some different sorts of cells to get better results. Maybe car -K will bring us some response um, for T, non hodgkin lymphoma, for instance, or, or Hodgkin. So we'll see. And I think the interesting part of this webinar is the fact that we've got industry but we've, we've also got that off-the-shelf CAR-T happening in different provinces as well. So can we uh, like throw it out to everyone here? Um, how how can there be this collaboration between, is it possible to have this collaboration between industry and this off the shelf so that we are bringing it to more patients and we're able to uh, do it in a way that's more uh, uh, resource friendly for the governments, let's say. Uh, Great question. <laughs> um, I mean, it's always, I mean, off the shelf is something, but it's not everything, right? So um, the outcome following CAR T is a multi variable. Um, landscape, I would even say. So it's not only the CART itself, but it's also the patient, it's immune dysregulation, his tumor, the treatment he's received so far. There, there's like numerous factors to take into account in choosing what's the best thing. And I mean, from a clinician perspective, the cha challenge is always that once you have phase three trial published with, you know, strong, effective treatment proven to bring in something with a phase one kind of puts puts us in a different place where we know that things have been proven and are effective. And, and so, I mean, my point is really that those innovative therapy probably will have to fit in patients who have no access for different reason on the, on the moment to the proven therapies. And then we're going to be able to move on and do, you know, 
create science and compare them and, and see what's 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 done. But from a clinician perspective, when we have like phase three with survival benefit, I mean it it speaks out by itself. It's a strong message. Levin, did you want to chime in there? Um, no, I sort of a, a, agree definitely with what Dr. Flurry said, but I think there's a place for everything here, right? Uh, you know, I'm very interested with like O2 because it's a CD22 antigen to see, you know, what does that look like and and where does it fit? Uh, will it, you know, uh, be used in CD19 relapses or does it have also, you know, benefit in patients who, who have not yet uh, seen a CAR-T. So there's still lots of interesting questions to answer and, and lots to explore. And I think, you know, um, it, it only benefits Canadian patients to have uh, many different options available to them. I couldn't agree more. And the um, um, the cheeky um, analogy that I, that I frequently used is that this is very much an all hands on deck kind of approach. And we need all of the efforts in the sector aligning, all aligning to the same vision, which is to provide these um, and develop and provide these innovative therapies for patients. So I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And um, Levin, you bring up the good point about the CD22 uh, and the, the relapse of the CD19. And is there like a possibility to see right now, it's just the one time infusion, but is it possible to see somebody who has failed on a CD19 or, you know, whatever it may be, get a second infusion? Oh, so of the same of the same uh, product? Yeah, I mean, there there have been. So in part of our clinical trials, um, there was the option for patients to receive a second infusion. But I think... By and large, unfortunately, you know, and, and Dr. Flurry can chime in here, once you have that failure to that first infusion, the chances of success with that second infusion of the same product go down dramatically. So, you know, unfortunately, that that is why it's sort of in our label is a one time infusion, because you know that it, it's not something that you can continue to infuse and, and get the same results, which is unfortunate. Uh, even Even if it's happening in an earlier line? Uh, I, I mean, we continue, I think, in clinical trials to, ha to have that as an option. But by and large, we have seen that, you know, if if your response, the, the first response kind of dictates what the second response is. And typically, you'd want to give that second infusion if you didn't have success uh, with the first infusion. But that also, you know, it kind of predicts uh, a similar outcome. And that's why we're sort of, exp you know, looking at at novel antigens to see what do you do if someone has failed a, a CD19 car? Is there a second antigen that we can target or can we target two antigens at the same time um, to decrease the likelihood of, of a relapse? I agree. I think I think you highlight a good a good point. And, and I think that not all diseases are the same, right? In large B cell, I will definitely uh, agree. I know that in ALL, the kids, they might have benefit from a second infusion, not, not you know, when they're like full-blown relapse, but when we see that they're losing their CAR-T and they mm -hmm. might, you know, surf on a second wave. So I think we have to kind of put into perspective of which disease you're treating and what you have as a CAR-T because they're not all the same, right? They have different mm -hmm. profile of expansion and persistence. So I think, again, it's a compli complicated um, <laughs> answer to get, but... Um, uh, in large piece, I don't think I would give, again, a second criteria if it failed. I mean, there's lots of new options. Some of them are alluded in the chat. Um, there's, um, we need access to those innovative therapies. So I'm grateful to be on, on that uh, that webinar with Vera and Eric and, and, and Kajiria, because I mean, you guys are providing what we as you know, clinician needs for the patient access options. That's what we need. And speaking of, of access, uh, Stephanie, if I can ask you, like, when can we expect to see something like a Click01 or a Click02 uh, approved and available outside of clinical trials? That is a, a great question. Um, that is a great question. I think it will depend on a on a multitude of different factors. Uh, the chief one being funding uh, to to develop these kinds of assets and to collect uh, sufficient data. Um, this kind of clinical trial, uh, the kind of manufacturing, uh, the you know the cost of these therapies, 
uh, reflect in part the, the cost of, of producing them. And uh, so, um, you know, that is a, an immense factor to take into consideration. So um, I'm unable to say at this point when we would be able to seek uh, this kind of approval for the CD19 or the CD22 or the multiplex car at this point, uh, because there is uncertainty, um, you know, there's un huge uncertainty right now in the funding landscape in Canada uh, for this kind of work. Yeah, I mean, it would be very unfortunate not to see that project uh, come to completion. And I couldn't, I couldn't agree. Like the um, the sunk cost, right? I mean, BioCanarex has invested a very significant amount of its limited funding in the development of the Click platform to get this kind of platform up and going, and we have the momentum now. Uh, and we're seeing new projects being onboarded and different academic teams making use of, you know, what has been put in place, interest in other provinces in, in ramping up uh, their own programs so that they themselves are able to produce uh, their own CAR T cell therapy. So I, I couldn't. So all of these, um, you know, th this type of momentum and goodwill and interest uh, has been built up across the country. So, um, we, you know, it remains to be seen, uh, but without a further injection of funding, uh, it will be very, very difficult to, um, to continue and to also to continue with a national approach uh, to developing these types of these types of therapy, which in Canada is quite unique to, to mm -hmm. see uh, these very large groups of researchers all working together on their separate piece, but then all coming together to be able to produce these therapies and, and treat their patients at, at their respective clinical sites. Right. Well, thank you to the three of you for uh, your presentations and your engaging discussion. I'm going to open up the q and I, I did see that in the chat there was already a question, so I won't even start with my question. I'll start with uh, the question in the chat. Uh, so thank you for your patience uh, in, in waiting for this to be responded to. Uh, how, Kite, how is Kite planning to work their ways in comparison to bispecific antibody like Lunsumio in relapse refractory FL and uh, Polyvi and ADC, which is now approved in first line DLBCL in the US. And uh, are, are they better in terms of safety and efficacy and also in terms of cost? I'm leaving. I'm going to assume that one's for you. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a, a challenging question is to sort of how do we determine you know, efficacy differences between products, cost effectiveness analyses, when, you know, I, I'm sure we can all see that there's not really, I, I don't think there's going to be a future where we're putting all of these in head-to-head -head clinical trials against each other. So really that is left to sort of, you know, uh, real world data to try to compare outcomes. Of course, that can also have, has its limitations because, you know, certain products uh, may be favored in certain patient groups, so it's quite difficult to, you know, make these types of comparisons. So, uh, you know, we are actively engaged in in real world evidence analyses to try to compare uh, um, outcomes um, between different therapies and associated cost effectiveness analyses. But, um, you know, we 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 try to be a, a data driven company and and do our best to to highlight the efficacy of our car t products um, but it's going to be quite challenging from a you know putting these together head to head and and seeing the differences in outcomes and i think just going back to um I, i'll start with my question now uh waiting for those who have questions to put them into the q a or even in the chat uh, but just going back to the comments uh, stephanie you were just making about funding uh, and even like for industry and uh, from the clinician perspective, uh, how can patients and the general public contribute to the advancement of CAR T cell therapies and ensure that these innovations reach those they need? Oof, that's a that's a big question. Um, mm -hmm. What can patients do? Um, patients can continue to put pressure on the government. Um, uh, BioCanRx engages with a number of different patient groups and organizations uh, to support those groups. Um, 
I, I see uh, LLIC is on the call and uh, they, they have been a wonderful partner, a great collaborator in terms of being able to help us advance our CLIC platform and specifically expand the reach of our CAR-T program. So supporting organizations like, um, like this uh, while also uh, while also continuing to put pressure on government um, that, you know, every year Canadian taxpayers make very significant investments in research in Canada. Um, and uh, we should continue to, to make more of these investments because we're going to really, really fall behind. So um, I would implore, um, you know, those that are listening to this call to um, continue to support um, you know, organizations, um, you know, that support research and also to, you know, implore, uh, you know, the general public patients uh, to also ask the government to um, put more support towards research, uh, specifically support for preclinical to clinical translation, which is something that we haven't really done very well in Canada in terms of supporting. And it's critically important for us to being able to advance Canadian technologies through the preclinical development all the way to clinical trials. That's the only way um, that we're going to be able to get more clinical trials in Canada that are based on Canadian technologies. Thanks. Isabel? Hi. <clears throat> I agree. I mean, um, what else can be out? I, I agree with with the whole line. I think we need more support. We need translational, you know, research in Canada to help us to access those therapy for patient. Again, I'm a patient advocate, right? So I want to have access um, to the fastest. Levin, do you have any additional thoughts to add to that question? Uh, no, no, just agree with uh, everything that's been said. <laughs> Oh, all right, so we, we do have a question here in the chat. How do you see the future of in vivo CAR-T treatments panning out, especially on a clinical trial and regulatory? Um, okay, I, I, I believe that, I think that refers to, to sort of novel manufacturing approaches. Um, so yeah, in the current generation of CAR-T, after you make the CAR-T cells, you're essentially growing them out uh, to the correct dose before you infuse back into the patient. But um, looking at whether you can reduce that amount of time and actually get the CAR T cells back into the patient and allow some of that expansion, more of that expansion, because it does happen currently, more of the expansion to happen within the patient is, is an area of active research, uh, including from Kite Gilead. So, you know, we're looking to see not only will that be able to potentially shorten the turnaround time that Dr. Fleury alluded to, but Potentially also could the, you know, the phenotype of the T cells that you're infusing be different with this approach. So it is, you know, uh, we act actively look at what what type of T cell phenotypes are uh, associated with better outcomes and looking to see if you can shorten that manufacturing, do the expansion in vivo. Um, will that lead to a different, you know, phenotype of the CAR T cells and, and hopefully lead to not only um, shorter turnaround time, but better overall outcomes. And Stephanie, would you like to add something? No, I, it's a, this is a very, very exciting uh, field uh, and area uh, of research when it comes to uh, CAR T development and future CAR T development. Um, and again, um, it's extremely promising um, and, and needs more investment, more support. So it's a very interesting avenue to explore. And uh, Stephanie, I did want to mention if uh, if it's possible for you to share your slides with me, and I will post them with the recording uh, of the of the webinar. Wonderful, thank you, Sabrina. Yeah. All right. So. Um, we, we are coming close to our 1 p.m. Uh, end time, and I did ask that the panelists um, prepare just like a, a closing remark. Um, so just, you know, um, a final thought or key takeaway from today's discussion. And uh, Stephanie, you can you can go ahead and start. 
Uh, great. Thank you very, very much. Um, so I, I trust that the folks that are attending uh, this webinar today, I hope you've gotten a sense of if the excitement of uh, that's being expressed by all of the different sectors in uh, improving access and improving uh, access to new innovations uh, here in Canada. It's a very, very exciting time uh, for the field. Um, and um, I, the final message that I would like to convey is that there is a literal army of scientists, of clinicians here in Canada uh, that have banded together and are working together to, uh, to make things better when it comes to access to innovative medicines and increased access to clinical trials here in Canada. And um, we look forward to being able to continue the work. It's, it's too important uh, to stop. Thank you. Uh, Levin, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to close to say, you know, on, on from the perspective of Kite Gilead, uh, we're also, you know, really focused on bringing innovative medicines to Canadian patients, whether that be in routine clinical practice, but also in terms of bringing clinical trial opportunities to Canada as well, um, so that these patients, you know, have have the ability to, you know, patients with unmet need to have have the ability to get um, CAR T in the clinical trial capacity as well. And Isabel, the last word for you. Last but, but not the least, hopefully. So I, I mean, we're fortunate, we're privileged. We're, we're, we're witnessing an era where the patient is empowered to fight cancer. We need access, we need safety, we need efficacy. And I would give my final words to the patient. I'm again, very grateful for all those patients who participate in the clinical trial and make the future happening. Really, it's. It's all for you. It's all because of you. So thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you very much to uh, our panel of speakers who generously shared their expertise and their time. And a special thank you to our audience who, who came on to listen to us have a conversation. Um, the recording will be available uh, at Cancer Collab. Uh, or by early next week. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is the first of a two-part webinar series. So the second one is going to be taking place October 3rd, uh, also at 12 p.m. Uh, Eastern uh, Standard Savings Time, or I we probably won't be there by then, but so e EDT. Um, and the the theme of that one will be looking back to move forward and the lessons learned from the implementation of of the first generation CAR T's across Canada and how that is going to help us with the implementation of new CAR T's coming into the pipeline and actually other innovative medicines as well. So uh, with that, thank you so much uh, to everyone for being here and thank you to our sponsors for uh, this to for